So average rate of change, which sometimes gets abbreviated in our book as AROC, um, just for fun. But average rate of change, you want to think like old school slope. So meaning if we're talking average rate of change, we're thinking like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We just give these some grown-up calculus names. And those grown-up calculus names, we think about this as like f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So generically, it's labeled as the average rate of change, but this could also show up as the average velocity. Or this could show up as the average speed. And since we know that where that definition of the derivative comes from is by starting with this old school slope between two points and then squeezing things together until we're taking the limit as the distance between them goes to zero. Well, that means that we can move from the average rate of change to what we call the instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change where you want to think derivative. And this might also come out as average velocity, instantaneous velocity. And before you get too comfortable, there's a ceiling panel above your head and I recommend not sitting there. Oh, yeah, right. sorry. That's all right, I'm glad to say something. Yep. That's right here. Yeah. So that instantaneous <laughs> rate of change or the derivative, um, this also gets called the instantaneous velocity. But the truth is that from a like calculus slash physics perspective, we don't have to include the word instantaneous. When it says velocity, that means we're using the derivative. Derivative. Um, the problem has to explicitly state average velocity if you shouldn't use the derivative. The other thing that our instantaneous rate of change or derivative, right, that's like the physics context is that we're talking about it as a velocity. The econ context here is that we're talking about marginals, which also means we're using the derivative. And both of these contexts are in that same section of our book in section 2.3. That's really just a whole bunch of vocabulary stuff. Now let's talk actual problems. Um, so I'm gonna build up to an equation that's given in our textbook, but I'm, I'm gonna, build up there hoping that maybe a few of you in the room have had some physics class ever in a previous life. It might have even come up in chemistry, who knows. If I asked you, what's the gravitational acceleration everywhere on earth? Does anyone have a number for me? I like the negative, it's a good start. Gravitational acceleration on Earth. Those of you on Zoom, you're welcome to put a number in the chat too. Guesses are fine. I'm, I'm gonna take the point something and your eight. I'm just gonna put them in the other order. Sorry, my pen's not playing nicely here. Yeah, negative 9.8 and units wise, that's meters per second squared. And that's the gravitational acceleration on Earth. You don't need to write this down. Because 
The reason you don't need to write that down is our textbook doesn't work in the metric system. So I've got a number that probably none of you know, and that is this is really negative 32 feet per second squared. That's actually our gravitational acceleration everywhere on Earth. That's the one our book's going to use. So if you were going to write something, that's the number that you want to write down. Now, you don't really need to write that number down, um, but I'm going to build up the formula in the textbook using that number. So the thing that maybe it's helpful to have um, some physics background for, but it doesn't really matter if you don't. It's helpful if you've ever ridden in a car or another moving vehicle. That part? Yeah. Um, so there are some more physics-y words. But words that we also use in our everyday life. So if you are driving down the freeway and you, let's say that I'm going 65 miles an hour on the freeway and I accelerate, just common sense wise, what changes about that situation? If I say I accelerate, totally, I'm going faster, right? So if I'm going faster, it means I've changed my velocity. From a physics-y perspective, that means that the acceleration is the change in velocity. And when we're talking about rates of change, that means we're taking a derivative. So if I knew what my velocity function was, then to get the acceleration, we took a derivative. Now, I already said that the derivative was some, or that the velocity is somebody's derivative. The somebody there is, we got different phrases for it. If we have things that are falling, we call it the height, but more generally, we might call it the position. And so we might use the letter S or we might use the letter H. And the velocity is the derivative of that. So everywhere on Earth, our gravitational acceleration is this constant value of negative 32 feet per second squared. But that is secretly the derivative of the velocity. Was that a ladder I heard outside? Maybe, no, I don't know. So I'm gonna challenge us. We have not done this before, but if negative 32 is the derivative, does anybody know what the function was? I know we like just learned derivative shortcuts and now I'm making you go backwards. But we had some function and when we took the derivative, we got negative 32. I like it. Oh, cool. Someone's trying to go like all the way up to the position function. We'll get there. I'm not going all the way up. I'm going to take it one step at a time. So would you believe that I told that if I told you this was 32 T, if I took the derivative, would I get negative 32? Yeah. And then really we could also have a constant over there because the derivative of a constant is zero. So our book calls that constant V naught. Now, if I take it one more step, and this would be the particularly challenging part, but you can imagine that um, if this is my derivative, it came from some function, I'm just gonna give you the function and then we can verify the derivative part. It's negative 16 T squared plus V naught T plus, and I'm gonna use S naught here. Um, we can swap that out for an H, but generically, 
This is our position function if things are falling and only subject to Earth's gravity. So this is for stuff falling on Earth. Which is why sometimes we use an S for a position and sometimes we just use H because we think about it as height because these are the equations for stuff that is falling. I'm just gonna warn you there's a ceiling panel. I, I wouldn't sit under that. Um, for those of you on Zoom, I feel like you should have the benefit of seeing what I've been talking about. Yeah, that's right. There's a panel hanging from the ceiling. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so back to this lovely problem. So the particular question that was asked on this practice midterm, um, he has given you the formula and I don't think that you need to memorize it though since you all get a little note card, maybe it's worth putting it on there just in case. Right, so the formula that he's given us is negative 16 t squared plus v naught t plus h naught, right? And he's using h for height, which totally the s for position or the h for height, either way, they're interchangeable. Um, oh no, what happened? There we go. Okay, so then we've been given some information. We've been told that a diver jumps off of the diving board at 30, two feet in the air with an initial velocity of 16 feet squared. So those pieces of information are giving us values for some of these constants. So that V naught there, that's the initial velocity. And that H naught is the initial height. One of the things that we have to be careful about um, in these problems is the signs. So this assumes that positive heights are up. So if I'm moving, if I have an object that's moving up, then it has a positive velocity. And if it's moving down, it has a negative velocity. So just like some quick examples. If I was holding this pen and I throw it up, right? It had an initial height that was positive because it didn't start on the floor. And it had an initial velocity that was positive. We think about the ceiling panel that's dangling by one little metal pin. Um, right now, it has an initial height that's positive, right? Because it's on the ceiling. I don't know, what do we think? Is this room about 16 feet? Um, so it's hanging about 16 feet. It's not moving right now. So its initial velocity would be zero. If I had this pen and I was holding it at a particular height and I dropped it, then we say that the initial velocity was zero because it wasn't moving before I dropped it. And then as soon as I dropped it, it starts moving. If I started with my pen on the ground, well, nothing would happen. It couldn't really fall but it would have an initial height of zero. Cool. So back to this question, we were told that the diver, that the diving board is 32 feet off the ground. So that means my initial height is 32. And the diving board, I mean, here's a little bit of cultural context, right? But if you haven't seen the diving board, you'd have a pool and then something that is sticking up above the pool the diving board would not be below the water. So that's gonna be a positive 32. With an initial velocity of 16 feet per second. Well, it would be really hard to be like standing on a diving board and somehow shove yourself down, right? So if I'm standing on the diving board, those 16 feet per second, that's gonna be a positive value because we're like jumping off the diving board to go into the water. So that's a positive 16. Well, that makes our equation for the height, let's get rid of that part. That makes the equation for the height in this problem, negative 16 T squared plus 16 T plus 32. 
Now there are a bunch of oh, questions. Yeah. Oh, so position. So um, our book uses both H and S. So you just might see it written as S like in a textbook problem, or you might see it written as H. But either way, we're talking about the position. Yeah, it's just whether we're calling that position height or we're calling it position. Yep. Now there are a bunch of questions that I can ask about this. I can ask about what's the height at a particular time. I could ask what the velocity is at a particular time. I could ask what the acceleration is at a particular time, or I could hide some of that information in context. Well, let's see what he did. How fast is the diver moving when they hit the water? Well, the question how fast means we're looking for a, a velocity. But there's kind of a trick here to the next part because, oops, that's a W, I swear. When he hits the water, is kind of secretly giving us a time, but sort of hiding the time from us. So when would imply that we're, that there's some sort of time there? But hitting the water means that our height came to be zero. Standing on the platform, jumped up, came back down, hit the water. When they hit the water, the height is zero. So this is like the time when the height is zero. It's two questions for the price of one. So our final answer we're looking for is to find the velocity, but to get there, we need to figure out what time it is when the height is zero. And I will give everybody a minute on your paper to figure out what T is if we set that height equal to zero. If something factors, that's usually our fastest option. I can see right now that I can definitely pull out a 16. And I, this is my personal hang up. I have a much harder time factoring with a negative in front of my squared term. I know it's my personal hang up, which you might not have, but I'm actually gonna factor out negative 16 because that's just how my brain works. Don't erase stuff if that's not what you did. We should get the same answer. I just can't handle it the other way. So if I factor out negative 16, then this becomes a minus T so that when I multiply it back in, I get the positive 16 T squared. And then on that 32, that's gonna be a negative two again, so that when I distribute the negative 16 back in, I get back to the positive 32. So I would factor this to say negative 16, t minus two, t plus one, which is actually giving us two times, right? If I solve for that, that's telling me that t could be negative one or positive two. And then I have a really bad math joke. Brace yourself. You can have a good time, you can have a bad time, but you can't have a negative time. So we are not including the negative one. We cannot, in fact, go back in time. So t equals two is like the point in time where we are now looking to answer the how fast question. And somehow I'm going to squeeze this all in. So if I'm looking to answer the how fast, I know I need to find the velocity. And the velocity is the derivative of the height. So my velocity here, when I take the derivative, we are not gonna use limit definition of the derivative. We're just using our rules here. So I'm gonna take that negative 16, multiply by two. So I'd have negative 32, reduce the power by one. So now I'm at T. 
that 16 T, that'll just be a plus 16. And the derivative of 32 is zero. Which by the way, matches our like generic velocity equation if you had them all written down from the book. So that means that my velocity is gonna be negative 32 times two plus 16. By the way, just as a reality check, it makes sense that our velocity here is gonna be negative. Because at the, point, at the moment that he hits the water, he's traveling downward, this diver is. So we're expecting that velocity to be negative, which it is if we work that out. So negative 32 times two, that's negative 64 plus 16, I get negative 48. Now I would be picky about this next part. I want to see units on that answer. This equation that we have for the height is in feet, which means our derivative here should be feet per second. Is um, like, is f of x continuous everywhere? And I could also ask if it's differentiable everywhere. But let's start with the continuous everywhere part. So that word continuous, we have a definition for that. And we should go back to the definition when we're trying to work through the problem. Even if you can like do math in your head to answer the question, we've got to be able to show it with limits. So our definition for continuity I'm just gonna sneak it up here. F of X is continuous. Uh, and it doesn't really, I'm choosing to use the letter A. You could use C, but is continuous at X equals A if F of A exists. The limit as X approaches A from the left is equal to the limit as x approaches a from the right. And the f of a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And for sure, oops, smeared that, good times. You're gonna want that in your notes. Um, and there's a question in the chat about what differential me differentiable means. Differentiable means this exact same thing, but everywhere there's an f of x, put a prime on it. So we'll get there in a second, but let's start with continuity and then we'll talk about the differentiable part. So if we start looking at this, there are two places where we might worry about this. We might worry about this at four and we might worry about it at zero. So we're gonna check both at four and at zero. So at X equals four, first of all, we wanna know, is there somewhere that we are allowed to plug in the four? And this is really where we're looking at those inequality symbols. And because I have an or equal to, I have a place where we can plug in the four. And it's that top part of the function. So I'd have the square root of four plus one, square root of four is two, two plus one, I get three. Great, we got a number. Really the only thing that's gonna go wrong there is something that might go wrong with the domain, right? Taking the square root of a negative or dividing by zero, or that there just isn't anywhere in the function itself that gives us the or equal to option. Now we'll slide into the limits. So if I take the limit as x approaches four from the left, top, middle, or bottom, which function is on the left of four? Just a little to the left. Yeah, totally. So two x minus five. And what do we do with the limit problem? We plug the number in. So if I plug the number in, I've got two times four, that's eight minus five, I get three. 
So then the question becomes, do we get the same thing when we take the limit as x approaches four from the right? On the right-hand side of four, we should be looking at the top piece of the function. And when we plug four in, we also get three. So these limits do match. And these also match. So we are continuous at x equals four. Yep. So what was the point of doing the f of four before we did the limits? So technically, if you if you were gonna get full credit from me on this question, the definition for that continuity requires all three of these pieces to be true. So I've got to see all three of those pieces on your paper somewhere. Whether you do it first or you do it at the end doesn't really matter, right? So just strategically, if you were trying to save time, checking the limits first might be the faster option because if it fails this, you wouldn't have to worry about the other one. So is it always going to look like at x equals something or is it going to be like, Will ever look differently than that? that first part. Um, like at a particular point. Yeah, like what if you don't have the equality? Oh, well then it's already not continuous. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if no, like if I got rid of this, and that just said x is greater than four, it's not continuous at four. Yeah. So all three of those pieces have to be true. Um, just because a couple questions are piling up in the chat that are not necessarily related to this specifically. Yes, you should memorize derivative rules. Though since you get a note card, if you don't want to memorize them, I guess you could write them as long as writing formulas make sense to you. Well, we also now have to check zero, right? Because we're like not done with this. We also have to check at zero. So now if we look at x equals zero, I just always go in order. So I check f of zero first. Quick check is that middle function where I have the or equal to part. So two times zero minus five, I get negative five, we're good, we got a number. And then I go in to check, to check the limits. So the limit as x approaches zero from the left. Well, on the left-hand side of zero, we should be looking at that bottom piece. So x squared plus x minus five. And when we plug in zero, we get negative five. And we wanna know, is that the same as if we take the limit as x approaches zero from the right? And it ought to be because I tried really hard in my head to make it all work out. So they do match. And it's equal to the value of the function. So it is continuous at x equals zero. So now if I were to state where it is continuous, technically answering this question is yes, it is continuous everywhere. If I had to write the interval on which it is continuous, I could say negative infinity to positive infinity because there was nowhere that we found a discontinuity. But the second part of my question here is f of x differentiable everywhere. that up. Um, so differentiable means the derivative is continuous. So if we take those same three pieces from our definition of continuity and apply them to the derivative, that's what our definition of differentiable means. 
So we're thinking about does F prime of A exist? Does the limit as X approaches A from the left of F prime of X match the limit as X approaches A from the right of F prime of X? And are they the same? Is F prime of A equal to the limit as X approaches A of F prime of X? So when we take the derivative of a piecewise function, what we have to be super careful about is when we have the function and we have those like greater than or less than or equal to's, we don't automatically put those or equal to's in when we take the derivative because we don't necessarily know that they're gonna match up there. And we don't include them unless they do match up. So I'm just, you, I'm writing the same function again. Don't write it again in your paper. I just can't get it all on one screen. Um, so I'm just gonna write it again. So our f of x looked like, so I'm gonna take a moment to rewrite this as x to the one half, just to spare myself writing it twice. So if I go to find F prime, I'm gonna have these same three pieces, but I'm gonna write these all as just the inequalities, not with the or equal to's. And then we're gonna take the derivative of each piece of it. So if I take the derivative of X to the one half, I would get one half x to the negative one half. If I take the derivative of 2x minus 5, derivative of 2x would be 2, and the derivative of negative 5 is 0. And then my last part here, if we take the derivative, that's going to look like 2x plus 1. Yeah. So we actually don't define the derivative at a point unless it's going to match up from both sides. So I have to check whether it's going to match up from both sides first. We can't say that the derivative is equal to this at x equals 4 because the derivative isn't defined unless it's matching up from both sides. Um, like what that might look like on a graph, because I think it's worth it just to quickly talk about this from like what we're talking about with differentiability. So if I had a function that looked like, and it doesn't even have to be that complicated of a function, but let's say I had kind of a parabola and then a line shooting off this way. This is continuous. And if I told you that this line over here was like y equals 2x plus one, and it, oh wait, mm, no, I don't wanna get in. And this is some kind of parabola. Since the derivative is telling me about the slope, if I start thinking about slopes in here, slopes of tangent lines, then this parabola right at the bottom has a slope of zero. What's the slope of the line I drew? So the derivative is not defined right here because from one side, I have a slope of zero and from the other side, I have a slope of two. So whenever we have a piecewise function, we're not gonna have the or equal twos included in the derivative. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Now let's go back to the picture. So we don't have those or equal to's, but we can still check to see whether this thing is differentiable. Thinking about, and 
really, we sort of don't even need the top one in that definition for differentiability, because if the limits from the left and right don't match, it's not differentiable. The reason that we include the top one is we can talk about differentiability for something that is not piecewise. So, and I'll get to an example of that in a, oh no, actually we kind of have an example right here. So the square root of X plus one, that's continuous on its domain. When I take the derivative, because that's got a negative exponent, that means that X is technically in the denominator. So I can't plug in zero, which means even if that was like my entire function and it wasn't piecewise, the it would not be differentiable at zero because I couldn't plug in zero to it. I know I'm getting into the weeds here. Let's just finish the problem. Let's check at four and zero to see if these derivatives match up. So at x equals zero, if I look at the limit as x approaches zero from the left, left of zero, that's gonna be that two x plus one. So I would get one. And if I look at the limit as X approaches zero from the right, on the right hand side of zero, the function is two. There's nowhere to plug in that X. One does not equal two. This is not differentiable at zero. And then if we check at four, at x equals four, when I go from the left-hand side, limit as x approaches four from the left, that's that middle function, two. And the question is, does that match up? <laughs> okay, there's something in the air right now. Limit as x approaches four from the right. And on the right-hand side of four, the function we're using here is that one-half x to the negative one-half. Well, if I plug in four and take the square root, I've got two. And if I raise two to the negative one power, that's the same as one-half. A half times a half gives me a fourth. Those are not equal. So it's not differentiable at zero or four. Continuous there, but not differentiable there. Question. Yeah. The right hand side is zero. Um, oh, one does not equal two. So the, the derivative is two. It's not two X. It's not two minus X. It's not two plus 17 X. It's just two. So there's nowhere to plug in the limit. The answer is just two, right? Like to get the one, I plugged in zero for X, two times zero plus one. But there's, there's nothing to plug in here. It just is two. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yes. Um, mathy stuff, mathy stuff, words. Oh, look, there's a question mark. That's telling us to do something. 
I'm going to work backwards from the question mark to find the question word. Oh, the question does. Great. So that's telling me to do something. If I'm trying to decide if this limit exists, then I know that I need to take a look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of f of x. And I want to know, is that the same as the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of g of f of x? Um, one of the like mathy properties of limits is that, is that I can pass the limit inside, meaning I don't actually know what the function f of x is, which means I can't turn this whole thing into a function. But what I can do is to treat this as asking me what's g of the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x. And is that the same as g of the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x? And these we have values for. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x, he's given us a value of 1. So this is g of 1. And we're asking ourselves, is that the same as g of 3? Now I can take the 1 and 3 and plug them into our g of x equation. So I'm looking at 1 squared minus 4 times 1 plus 3. And is that the same as 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 3? Um, so that's 1 minus 4 plus 3, which I'm pretty sure is 0. And this is 9 minus 12 plus 3, which I'm also pretty sure is 0, which means the answer is yes. Um, so my first step is going to be to rewrite this, which means I'm going to treat this as 3x squared over x cubed plus 4x over x cubed and simplify both of those before I take a derivative. Because what I'm really hoping for is to make this look like a number times x raised to a power. Well, this first one, I've got one more x on the bottom than the top. So that's going to be 3x to the negative 1. I have not taken a derivative yet. Just rewriting the function. The second part, I've got two more x's in the denominator than the top. So that's 4x to the negative 2. The fact that we've been asked to find the equation of a tangent line, I should have started here, means I need a point and a slope. I've got the point, and to figure out the slope, that's why I'm rewriting this, because I want to take a derivative. Well, now when I take the derivative, I can use the power rule. So I'll have negative 1 times 3, subtract 1 from the exponent. Negative 2 times 4 subtract one from the exponent. So my slope at the x value that we care about it would look like negative three times one to the negative two minus eight times one to the negative three. And I was strategic in choosing one because one raised to a number is still one. So this is just negative 3 minus 8, or negative 11. That's my slope. And then you can choose how you want to, which version for the equation of a line you want to plug that into. Um, I'm going to go y minus 7 equals negative 11 times x minus 1. If you wanted to rearrange that to say y equals mx plus b, we could. Be y equals negative 11x. plus 17. If 
by the way, where is this function continuous? How about if I flip that around? Where is it not continuous? Totally, I got some zeros, got some zeros in the chat. Um, it's not continuous at zero. I can secretly ask you a domain question by asking you a continuity question. Right? So we think about those continuity questions as being piecewise, but they don't have to be. If it's not a piecewise function, then the question of continuity is the same thing as asking you the domain. So where is f of x continuous? Everywhere except for zero. So that would look like negative infinity to zero and zero to positive infinity. Correct. Okay. Yeah, can't have a zero in the denominator. That's why we got to leave it out. By the way, this is also not differentiable at zero because if we look at our derivative, oh, that's not the derivative. If we look at our derivative here, that's like a negative three divided by x squared, and that's a negative eight divided by x cubed. So both of those have an x on the bottom. So zero would also not work in the original function. I mean, in the derivative or the original function. So it's not, that's where it's continuous. That's also where it's differentiable. We've got about five minutes left. I can make up more problems. Anyone have a type of question you'd like me to make up a problem for? Asymptote? Sure. Let's do an asymptote problem. Um, but not this one. Or that one probably does have asymptotes, but I don't want to do that one. Um, so f of x is going to be x squared minus x minus 2 over x squared minus four. And let's find all asymptotes. I'm gonna start with the vertical asymptotes. And if I start with those vertical asymptotes, then my candidates, are going to be whatever makes the denominator zero. So if x squared minus four is equal to zero, I would be looking at two and negative two. By the way, that also would tell me something about the domain. So the domain of this function is everything except two and negative two. But now we'll check to see whether either of those are actually vertical asymptotes. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm looking at the limits. So if I take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus x minus 2 over x squared minus 4, if I plug in 2 to the top, I have 4 minus 2 minus 2. Oh, wait, that's 0. And if I plug in 2 to the bottom, that is also 0, which says we need to do more work. What's the more work I'm going to do? I get to factor my favorite F word. So I've got X minus two times X plus one all over X minus two times X plus two. And I know I factored that fast. Um, I just want to make sure we make it through the problem. So my X minus two over X minus two, those would cancel out. And when I plug in two, I'd have two plus one over two plus two or three fourths. So that's not a vertical asymptote. I have a hole on the graph there. 
But if we check the limit as x approaches to negative two of f of x, I'm gonna be lazy. So when I plug in negative two, I've got negative two squared minus negative two minus a two. And on the bottom, negative two squared minus a four. So I get that zero in the denominator, but in the numerator, I actually have four plus four. So now I'm at eight minus two, so that's six. Because we got a number over zero, I know that is a vertical asymptote. So I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative two. I said all asymptotes, so we should check the horizontal one. So if I take the limit as x approaches infinity, and I look at our function, I'm gonna take that largest power of x in the denominator, which is x squared, and I'm gonna to skip to dividing every term by x squared. So I'll have x squared over x squared minus x over x squared minus two over x squared, all over x squared over x squared minus four over x squared. which means that on the top, x squared over x squared turns into a one. x over x squared is like a one over x, but as I am approaching infinity, that'll go to zero. Two over x squared will also go to zero. In my denominator, that x squared over x squared is the one to one, and the four over x squared is headed to zero, so I would get one which means my horizontal asymptote is at y equals one.